Um, good morning, uh, good evening, good afternoon uh, to all the delegates. My name is Jerry LaForge. I'm organizing this conference, this uh, session on the on, on the Salud Mesoamerica Initiative, an innovative approach to improving quality in primary health care. Um, before we get going, there's some uh, technological housekeeping. Um, you will see on your screen uh, on the right side of the, of, the, of the conference portal, the live Q&A, that's where you will enter your questions uh, during the session or during the Q&A uh, part of, uh, of the session. There's also below that a discussion um, forum. And that is a, um, and that is for creating, for putting, starting a discussion or, or doing some, or making some comments. Um, and th both of those will be, are available during the entire, during the entire session. Um, the main, the main objective is to present the content, the techniques, lessons, and impacts of the quality improvement efforts of the Salud Mesoamerica program. Um, and I will now turn it over to um, Eduardo Pierre Gonzalez, who's our chair. Eduardo is uh, um, an economist, a uh, Mexican economist with 25 years of experience. He's currently the global fellow at the Wilson Center. Uh, he was the former um, uh, director general uh, of the Mexican Sur Clinical Foundation, finance director of the Mexican Institute for Social Security and formal Vice Minister of, of Health in Mexico. Um, he's very well experienced in, in working in, in, in Latin American developing co in, in countries on health systems and health economics. Over to you, Eduardo. Jerry, thank you so much. It is a pleasure to be here. We have a very exciting session with very excellent panelists and commentators. Uh, I might... Uh, First, uh, go over what the idea and objectives of the meeting would be. We have two presentations. Uh, Pedro will present first, and uh, then we'll, we'll have a presentation by uh, Jerry, and then we'll open up to uh, specific comments from uh, Nana and then from Emma. And then the idea would be to open up to a general discussion and uh, talk openly about um, the, the project and what has been happening in, with Salud Mesoamerica. Like Jerry was saying, I, I urge you to use the two, uh, the two panels on the side with the discussion forum and the uh, Q&A so that we can get uh, a lively interaction going on. So let me start by introducing our first uh, presenter, uh, Pedro Bernal. So Pedro is uh, a Mexican national. Pedro leads the impact evaluation agenda of Salud Mesoamerica Initiative. He is based in the IADB in Washington, D.C. Pedro has worked for the uh, initiative since 2014, basically conducting research on the effects of resource based funding for country governments and for health providers. And um, some and the innovations that have been implemented through Salud Mesoamerica have been uh, promoted and under the uh, guidance of uh, Pedro. So it is a pleasure to have you, Pedro. Um, please go ahead and then we'll pass on to Jerry for the second presentation. Great, thanks a lot, uh, Eduardo and, and Jerry. It's a pleasure to be uh, part of this, of this, of this panel. So I'm going to share some slides with you. The presentation just can you confirm that you're seeing my screen? We we can see it, Pedro. Perfect. So so what I'm going to present now is um, a brief description of what Salud Mesoamerica initiative is, and essentially its approach to to quality improvement. This is a uh, joint work with MIT Arte, which is also part of the, of the panel today, as well as other colleagues at IDB and Salud Mesoamerica uh, Initiative. So what Salud Mesoamerica is, is, is a public-private partnership that combines the work of the Ministries of Health in eight countries 
uh, with donors and, uh, and the Inter-American Development Bank. And, and it has worked to support the transformation of these eight government health systems, essentially to expand the coverage, access, and quality of services among the poorest women and children in, in Mesoamerica. The aim of the initiative is to reduce the inequity gap in healthcare services. And the challenge there is to ensure that every woman uh, and child, particularly those in the most remote uh, places, receive the care that they need uh, when they need it with the adequate uh, quality, which of course, you know, is a really pressing challenge and a difficult one. Uh, so let me start what is behind the theory of change of the initiative and then describe later a bit of the elements of, of what the initiative is. Uh, essentially, in this theory of change, what you see is the usual suspects in any theory of change. You see the, the health system inputs, some interventions, and then some outcome and impact level uh, uh, indicators at, at the end. But what we're going to focus here, or what I want to focus here, is what happens in between. We usually we call it like a black box, which is how does a system combine all of these inputs and interventions to actually produce health outcomes. Um, and in the initiative uh, has built several mechanisms to intentionally uh, exploit both individual and collective uh, mechanisms to try to influence performance. This could be either aligning incentives, either uh, motivation, either world culture, uh, along others. And the idea is that by building these interventions that influence both of these levels, they can improve system performance to produce results in quality and, and coverage of of care. Uh, by combining these elements like in the black box with a result-based financing model that will accelerate these changes, uh, we hope to, to find results. So that's, this is essentially the theory of change. And what are the elements that, that, that make this Salud Mesoamerica initiative? One is uh, this element we call collective in impact, which means that we have one aim, one common system of metrics that is used uh, across the initiative for, for all the different actors that, that participate. It has this part of results-based financing, which is a financing model uh, aimed at the national uh, governments, which, uh, in which countries provide half uh, equal parts of, of the cost of the interventions, and they receive uh, an incentive if they meet certain targets that are externally uh, verified. It seeks to implement cost-effective or, and or innovative interventions in these areas that are, are we are working in, in countries. And to do so, it also, and I think that's one of the key features of, of, the, of the model is it, it uses direct technical assistance that is very particular. It's, it's, not, it a, it's a direct technical assistance that, that's more like a system, has a more systemic approach than a programmatic approach. And it's very flexible and essentially it, it is not like one set of solutions throughout the, the initiative, but try, it tries to adapt, test uh, different things and, and quickly try to learn quickly to, to adapt the, this assistance to the needs of, of countries. And finally, part of the mandate of the initiative is to help them uh, support and, and scale the interventions that seem uh, successful. A bit more on the, on the result-based financing model, as I was saying, uh, what it involves is the cost of the interventions is divided equally between donation funds and, and country funds. And a, a set of targets, usually around 10 targets involving both process and outcome level uh, type of indicators are set in, in a set of different operations. And if the country meets 80% uh, of those targets, they receive half of what they, uh, added to the cost of the operation. So, so, and this, this is an incentive that is received by the national government and they can use it essentially in whatever they want as long as it's for the, for the, for the health sector. And how it's structured is that it's a structure in phases. Usually there are like three phases lasting about two years each. And at the end of each phase, there's an external verification of, of targets to see whether the country receives this incentive or not. Now I'm going to explain to you some of the a brief overview of the results we have obtained uh, so far in in the initiative. Um, this slide presents some results obtained uh, by external surveys conducted by the Institute of Health Metrics and, and Evaluation, both at baseline before the intervention started, and a follow up uh, essentially about four years later, between 2013 and 2017. And it's a 
it's just a sample of 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 indicators about the population coverage and of quality of care. And what we see is a huge amount of progress. For example, in population coverage, you see that in El Salvador, the use of modern family uh, planning methods increased close to 21 percentage point in this four year period. Uh, in Honduras, the coverage of institutional delivery increased close to 16 percentage points. And, and also in quality of care, there's also like substantial improvement. For instance, in Belize, the management of the NL complications according to, to guidelines increased close to 30 percentage points. And in Chiapas, um, there's a less, less of an improvement, but it's still like an increase in the management of obstetrical complications according to guidelines of close to 6 percentage points. So there's pretty much uh, large improvements across the board. And, and of course, what we want to know also is how how much of this progress can actually be attributed to the initiative and not say like some common trend. And for this, we have conducted impact evaluations in, in several countries. Here, I'm just showcasing the case of, of, of Honduras. And in there, you can see that we have found that using difference in difference methods, um, essentially 12 percentage points of the increase in institutional delivery in Honduras uh, can be attributed directly to, to the initiative and, and its model. And, and there's also large effects in quality of care in the management of obstetric and neonatal complications, according to guidelines, close to 20 percentage points. So, so there is progress, and this progress uh, can be attributed uh, to the initiative and in the studies we have we have done. But what we want to show you more and discuss much of this meeting is how we have accomplished the result, particularly in terms of quality uh, of care. Um, one of the interventions that has been key in some countries is, is that the, the initiative has supported the implementation of quality improvement strategies, which in, involves, uh, particularly at the hospital level, it involves forming QI teams, um, making them uh, measure their progress, they analyze their data, they identify gaps, and then uh, devise uh, plans to address those gaps uh, periodically. And this approach has been quite quite powerful, the data that you see there comes from, from Belize. And there can be substantial progress like uh, over time. And what uh, some of the, key, the some of the most important um, contributions of this approach is that often teams are able to find solutions that are actually, do not involve adding more resources to the system but just rearranging existing ones. No? For example, some teams, QI teams in the initiative have found that simply uh, dedicating an area to follow up a uh, woman in their immediate postpartum rather than having it scatter, scatter across the facility uh, as, as space is available can help them follow up them better and then reduce the likelihood that they develop a complication uh, later. It's a simple change, but it can be uh, quite uh, powerful. And I'm going to talk more about the, this, this QI approach that is of the initiative that not only involves the work of individual facilities working on their own, but also has some, some other uh, attributes to it. And the spirit of this approach is on Deming's theory of profound knowledge. And the idea is that the initiative is not only looking for uh, health workers to, to improve the subject knowledge uh, matter, like for example, like to know the clinical uh, guidelines and how to implement them or how to do PSA cycle, but rather combine these with profound knowledge of how a system improves and, and performs uh, over time. So what does this mean in, in practice? Um, essentially, the SMI approach to continuous quality improvement has, uh, has a systemic approach, and, and this systemic approach encompasses what's happening at the facility level. In this systemic approach, we encourage the participation of some national and national authorities in the work that facilities are doing. Like for, for instance, if there are like field visits that we conduct uh, with, with facilities, these authorities are there at the table and this helps them to learn the reality, this helps them to recognize the, the achievements that facilities have done and also help them to know what are the barriers that they need to lift at the system level for them to improve uh, even more. Uh, there's also like different feedback mechanisms instituted between the different levels. One of them is this, if these uh, type of field visit, but there's also even collaboratives done uh, between levels with, with participation from some national and national level, which is key for, for, for the systemic approach. There's also this aim with a common system uh, of metrics. It's a common aim with a common system of metrics, and the idea here is that uh, all individuals in the systems know exactly what they need to do in order to improve quality of care. So it's the translation of what the clinical guideline says 
to what you need to measure in terms of, of compliance with that guideline, but those elements that are more conducive to cool woman health, not like the whole set of, of clinical guidelines. And teams usually follow up their progress, both internally and externally. Internally, these, these QI teams uh, do measurements usually weekly or monthly. And externally, the Ministry of Health conducts measurements every a quarter, uh, for instance. And, and, and all of this is encompassed by a, by a supportive approach, meaning that when there's an issue that a problem that is, that is faced, uh, all the actors in the system try to find a solution. And also, if there's someone lagging behind, there's a six way to, to make that, that those, those getting to get on board on, 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 the, on the progress. And of course, the most important work is what happened at the facility level, where they conduct adapted uh, plan to study at cycles. And these facilities are trained uh, on the job with a learning by doing uh, approach. This adapted PDSA, I'm going to go deeper into what it, what it entails. And, and what it entails is, at its heart, is a health aim. This is what, what, what they wanted to do, like what maternal uh, health outcome they want to change. And linked to that is the healthcare process uh, that is more conducive toward that aim. For instance, they, they try to, to, they start by optimize, by documenting and optimizing um, maternal care processes, such as the management of neonatal complications, and trying to see how in their facility, in the day-to-day -day activities, they can bring life and, and apply the, the adequate guidelines in the day-to-day -day operations and they apply the process to, to do so. Then they follow up their progress with this common set of metrics. They can they use it with measurements weekly uh, or monthly. And in some countries, there's also some daily routine uh, follow-up uh, by teams that they conduct either making huddles and trying to analyze case management decisions still while patients are in the facility. And a part of this approach of learning by doing is that it encompasses uh, the use of job aids for, for health uh, UI teams to be able to implement every step in the process for the PDSA cycle. Now, some challenges and struggles we have found along the way. Um, QI teams have embraced the measurement and they now like to do it in, in most of the countries that we do, but they really struggled with that analysis, both in identifying, uh, interpreting correctly data, and second, in analyzing the right cause behind uh, a gap. Uh, we have found that managers or persons in leadership uh, positions usually have lack the abilities to lead QI efforts or to facilitate them throughout the system. There's also this tendency in most ministries of health towards a blame and shame culture that really inhibits learning when failures uh, occur. And it's also this tendency to view QI as an activity rather than a culture that helps like, improve. It's just one more thing in the to-do list that, that healthcare workers need to do. And probably the most pressing challenge is that is not just common in the region, but probably global, is how to go from a facility level QI to a system-wide uh, quality improvement uh, system. And some of the questions that we're, that we're looking at going forward is, we know that SMI works, but we would like to know what is exactly the contribution of this QI strategy on the outcomes we have observed. Um, we would love to learn, of course, how to scale and sustain what we have achieved. And most of the work, as I said before, has been done in hospitals. We would also like to know how much of this can be sustained also in primary care and can be affected in primary care. And finally, one of the questions that uh, I think has been more pressing for us, we know that middle managers are really important to move the system forward. But we wonder whether if we coach these middle managers to lead QI efforts can actually accelerate organizational change for, for results. In part to do that, that is what we're doing. Uh, we're doing a pilot study that will be in Honduras that we're gonna test two different approaches of building QI capacity. One is like the more traditional approach, the one you see on the left, when you build, um, teach frontline workers to do PDA cycles and to implement them. And the second one, which is the most innovative one, and Jerry will go that into more detail, is focuses on middle managers and in creating capacities on them and able to, so, so they are able to coach the frontline workers in the QI efforts that they, that they lead. And this pilot project, we're gonna evaluate it using a, a difference in difference design to evaluate its effects on quality of care indicators related to prenatal care, neonatal care, and cervical cancer screening. We're gonna do this, uh, this pilot in 18 primary care networks uh, in Honduras. And we're, with the design that we have, we will to identify the effect of the traditional type of training, just focus on providers, and also the added effect of this medium-term training uh, for middle managers. So 
This is essentially what we're doing uh, now, how we're moving forward. And I will now uh, refer to Jerry so he can go in more detail towards the middle managers program. Thank you so much, Pedro, for this very interesting experience, sharing it with us. I hope we can uh, revisit the sustainability question. I think that is a, a very impressive and very challenging lesson learned. And uh, we'll now pass over to Jerry. Uh, Jerry will be talking, like Pedro said, more about the design, the testing, and the launch of the quality improvement and management competency program. A brief introduction of Jerry. Uh, to many of us, Jerry doesn't need an introduction, but uh, for those that don't know him well, he's uh, now the Chief Technical Officer at uh, Acceso Global. Before uh, uh, founding Acceso Global, he worked for the World Bank as health, health specialist, and he worked with one of the with three of the major clients of the World Bank, Brazil, China, and India, where he gathered extensive knowledge and experience, especially on, on health reform and health system challenges. Uh, he has been at the bank involved in uh, efforts on engagement on senior public officials and has seen the agenda for research, evaluation and policy in many countries. He's been involved in uh, several Southeast Asia countries, Philippines and, and Vietnam on quality improvement, also in Honduras, as you will hear, and also on service reform delivery in India and pay for quality in Qatar. And he is now leading Accesos Global Development on the uh, SMI's uh, Salud Mesoamerica Quality Improvement and Management Program, as you will see in the next few slides. Over to you, Jerry. Okay, thanks a lot, Eduardo. Um, uh, and also thanks to Pedro and Emma. Um, as Pedro said, um, I'm going to be describing going a deeper dive into a, a, a program that's focusing on middle managers and supervisors, but I will use those terms interchangeably. Um, we had planned to run this in rural Honduras, this pilot, in June and July of last year, but due to the pandemic, it was postponed to later this year. When, um, when, we, when I submitted the abstract to, H, to the uh, HSR 2020, um, we were planning to report on the pilot and the evaluation that, that also Pedro presented, but we're obviously unable to do that. Uh, so I'll be mainly describing the program, but we'll get into a validation. I'd also like to acknowledge that um, I, we couldn't have done this without the continuous support and engagement of the, uh, of the Salud Mesoamerica team in Honduras and in throughout Central America and also Chiapas. But I also want to give a, a special hats off to Emma and Pedro who have accompanied us and have been just great collaborators from day zero on, the, on this with this program. I, these are the, the, basic, uh, the, 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 the basic content of my presentation. Uh, and you will see that there will be some overlap between what, and it, and it should be, between what was uh, what described, some of the elements described by Pedro and what I will, I will talk about. Um, I like to start off by just saying that this program you know, didn't come from whole cloth. Um, you know, it is it has been built. Uh, quality improvement uh, models have been built over time, starting in the 1950s with with Deming uh, Deming's framework for improving productivity. Then Langley and Associates uh, had a guide to improving organization performance in business and work settings um, in, in in the mid 90s. Then the Institute for Health Improvement adapted this to healthcare. And then other things have happened. Even um, you'll hear maybe later from Nana, her experience in Ghana, uh, some excellent work done on quality improvement in, in, third, in, in, in developing country context. But, you, but there in the, in the, uh, present in the uh, slide are four or five um, kind of components. Um, uh, the, the first involves putting learning into practice, learning on the job the importance of data. And I'll be talking a lot about certain soft skills that are, that are critically important, especially in trying to, to, to change a culture. And then the focus on organizational change. This is kind of my way of saying um, that it's somewhere between the broader high level system and the facilities. You've got to work to, to make the organization 
um, very much involved in quality improvement. And here we're focusing on the managers and the middle managers and supervisors in these organizations that are gonna be key for sustainability. And I should say on the side, there's less of a turnover among them than there is in, with frontline personnel. And if they do turn over or rotate, they may rotate to the same job somewhere else. So the skills will be carried with them. Um, and finally, finally introducing uh, some uh, collaborative learning models. Um, we work from these four ma uh, major premises and they're all incorporated in, uh, into the training program. Uh, you know, it's, it's the context, it's using mixed models, it's leadership and communication, and it's also about the importance of effectively uh, managing the change process. You'll see later on that we actually have uh, we actually have sessions on project management, which um, which uh, we think is very important in terms of managing the change process. So, in a way, you know, what what do we think this this what makes this program uh, um, from unique from a operational perspective? Um, especially in, in, in developing country settings. Um, first of all, and this way, again, hats off to the, to the SMI team that has just wonderful uh, counterparts also in, in Honduras among the, among, among, uh, uh, gov the government and, and, and non-government -govern non -government organizations. We, had, we were able to tap into a deep knowledge of existing conditions and, 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 and some of the issues that they face. Um, we combine uh, traditional learning with on-site coaching. Uh, we, as Pedro said, and I will have to re-emphasize this, we're, we're, we're focusing on the middle, these, the, these managers, these middle managers and supervisors of these or organizations that work with the front line. And here the front line are primary healthcare units, usually very small health centers. So some, are, some, some uh, include, some of these organizations run um, um, birthing centers. Um, and we try to emphasize a combination of, of, of soft skills, what we call hard skills, and these supporting tools. And I'll get into these in, in the next couple of the next few slides of what we mean by this. So here's some example of, um, of the soft skills um, uh, that are that are taught or are part of the program and teamwork, team learning, conflict negotiation, effective communication, feedback, and, and coaching. Uh, you see in the bottom right there, learning collaborative is not a skill per se, though running one certainly requires a lot of skills. Uh, and I have some experience in running, running collaboratives uh, with the Joint Learning Network, and it just takes uh, a combination of soft skills to do it right. And I'm not saying I've got it right. Um, and, um, and so the supervisors and managers will be running these learning collaboratives with frontline front teams, and it prevents a platform for teams for team members at different health units can, can learn from each other, share experience, share problems and solutions, creating a space for learning, for, for team learning and reflection. Um, change needs to be supported by data and learning comes from understanding patterns in data. And the program uh, curriculum consists of sessions and activities related to what, what we call hard skills. And this focus almost exclusively on measurement and data use tools. Um, process mapping, uh, uh, how to do run charts, short tar charts, guidelines for benchmarking, but we even get into displaying data and communicating results. Though communicating results um, can ar is arguably a soft skill, and we do take that up in in the so in one of the soft skill soft skill uh, sessions. Finally, we have uh, here are some examples of some of the supporting tools um, that we that are taught in the in the training or part of the training program. I don't know whether taught is the right word because as you see later is there's different learning, there's different teaching learning strategies. Uh, but we I divided these into three areas, problem solving, and you see some examples there, um, driver diagrams, cause and effect analysis, the quality improvement um, uh, tools, you already you already saw Pedro already explained, thanks for doing that Pedro, the PVSA cycle. Um, and the and then project management, um, you know, we we have guidelines for them on planning, developing work plans, securing feedback, running meetings, tracking progress, among other things. But we get very granular uh, for them in, in, in this. Now the actual program is there's 50 sessions 
uh, 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 across four modules. Now, each module consists of about four days, uh, a four-day workshop, um, and then it's followed by what we call the practice, task, and coaching period. Now, let's say PTC, uh, um, referring to this, and a PTC can be two to, or three months long, and I will describe this later on. The first module, um, it consists of soft skills. The second is the hard skills, the data management and interpretation. And then it's followed by module three when problem solving, um, the problem solving tools are, are there. And then the final, then the fourth, um, the fourth mo module is the learning organization uh, spreading and, 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 and uh, standing spreading change. And it's also the place where the, the teams, and I'll get to this a little bit later, will present their quality improvement projects, uh, hopefully to the minister and other dignitaries. Um, again, I just wanna, I wanna emphasize that we're dealing with organizations that are responsible for primary health care in rural India. Some of these are public organizations, uh, others are nonprofit, and they're all under, under contract. Some of what Pedro had described with the ministry to uh, deliver a package of primary health care services and the, the, and the contract focuses a lot on maternal child care. Um, and these organizations, as Pedro also mentioned, have received quite a bit, especially on the front lines, quite a bit of training on, on quality, on improving the quality of care they provide, especially for maternal child care. Um, and, but less so the managers and the supervisors. Uh, they've, they're knowledgeable of it, but and they're and they've been trained technically, but they have not necessarily run some of the quality improvement uh, um, uh, that that's been going that that's that's occurred. So what are these? Um, th what are their learning strategies? I've I've, I've referred to, I've already referred to these. Um, each each workshop session, face-to-face uh, -face workshop, was combined passive and active learning. But each session, as I suggested, was was followed by these PTC uh, practice task coaching periods that consisted of what we call experiential learning. And, and our next slides, I'll provide some examples of each of these. So we have the, the you know, traditional passive learning, um, you know, didactic, uh, didactic education in which we present the concepts um, um, as to uh, present the concepts of each of these uh, for the different for the different uh, skills. For, and I give three examples here of each of the different skills. We have the, for example, root cause analysis and, uh, is a hard skill, um, um, and then no, it's a problem solving tool. Excuse me. Then we have running. Then a, what is a run shot? There's an example of a hard skill. And then the bottom, you'll see the techniques to manage team dynamics is a is a soft skill. So we would have these. Let's just call it a presentation, kind of a talking head lecture to get uh, at, uh, to to communicate. You know what is the content here? But we were not happy with just doing that. Each one of the presentations of a skill. Um, also, in turn, uh, also um, entailed active learning. What, what did I mean? What do we mean by that? Well, here I think it's best to say, uh, best to describe this by way of, of example. We would have, for example, with process mapping, we would have small, you know, small group activity where people would be actually be we, we, we do exercises about process mapping. Could be uh, uh, getting to school in the morning. It could be. Um, uh, actually, turning on your TV set, you, you, you get you get all the different uh, you, you use the symbols, uh, start and end points, decision points, appropriate, and we try to make it a, a fun exercise. And then we have um, now some of us are may may remember Mr. Potato Head, but we use Mr. Potato Head um, to have the, to start simulating PVSA cycles uh, and and getting the teams to discuss faster ways of. Getting Mr. P putting Mr. Potato Head back together again, um, uh, and how could they improve accuracy and speed, and what could they do differently? How can they communicate better? So, uh, so uh, again, it was kind of an active exercise. And finally, we ran some skits on on uh, giving feedback. That's on the bottom right there of the, of the slide. Um, what to do, what not to do, uh, um, and uh, we would we would put teams together to practice um, um, uh, what to do and what not to do and giving feedback. 
and having others comment on it. So again, we try to get the active learning aspect of this um, um, uh, part and parcel of what we were doing, or, or part and parcel of the traditional uh, of learning. And finally, this is the, the experiential learning of the, of the PTCs. This is, uh, I I'll just repeat, this is the period um, between each module where the program participants will be, uh, uh, will, um, the, these are the managers, um, they will be coaching the primary healthcare units uh, on, on some of the tools and, and skills they learned, uh, but they themselves will be coached by the, uh, by the facilitators, the trainers uh, during this time. There, and there'll be uh, these uh, prolonged on-site visits by the, by the trainers to work with the supervisors and the managers as they go and work with the front line. And I think this is, this is best um, exemplified by this uh, graphic where you see on the left, the coach working with the supervisor, um, then they're working with the primary health team. And you see on the right, the different tasks that have to be completed uh, during the first period, it's working on qu um, quality problem identification. These are the different teams, the primary healthcare teams. Usually each supervisor may have anywhere from three to five or six different teams working in different, different health centers. The second part is the prob problem met. The second task in the, in the, in the, in, uh, the second module um, is problem measurement. Then they move on to the actual PDSA cycles and the testing and tracking. And all of this leads to a the in the final in the final kind of face-to-face -face module. People get together, uh, and we have a change ideas marketplace where, as I mentioned, the, hopefully the dignitaries come, and each of the teams presents a their quality improvement project. Um, we ran a uh, a validation, kind of a test, in July of 2019. The, um, we're hoping that later this year, early next year, we'll be able to do the, actually be able to do the pilot, um, and and then uh, after that, um, we look forward to any rollout to the other SM, SM, SMI countries. Um, I just want a few. We spent two weeks in Honduras uh, with a validation exercise. We actually worked with about um, six organizations plus uh, uh, members of regional offices or officials from regional offices and also from the Ministry of Health. We had about 24, 30, 30 uh, participants. We tested 18 of the 50 sessions. But when I say test the sessions, it wasn't just the uh, passive learning was also some of the active learning, as I as I um, um, said before. Uh, you see on the right that we got some pretty high ratings from them on this. Uh, this is a post a, the post uh, um, um, survey, a post session survey. We but we also went out and did a whole week of site visits and worked with and got to meet some of the teams, the supervisors, managers, and also. Uh, the the, the uh, PHC teams and the units. It was a wonderful experience. Um, and we want to get a sense of, we ran these focus groups to get a sense of issues, capacities to help plan for and run on-site coaching and time required for the PTC periods. Um, it's, we, a, a couple of barriers, uh, several barriers came to the fore as we spoke with them. Some of them were mentioned by Pedro, the name and blame culture, but also there were issues of hierarchies. There was kind of a compliance, a routine compliance orientation with indicators, huge variation in capacity and commitment, which it comes as no a surprise. And there were some kind of governance issues with uh, conflicts between tech, uh, temporary workers and civil servants. But we tried to adjust uh, we adjusted the sessions, the content of the sessions. I gave you two examples there. Uh, for example, uh, on the coaching session, we incorporated the content on how to improve interpersonal relationships with colleagues with whom one does not get along. Um, there, this was brought up uh, quite a bit. So we were, we, I think we, we designed some skits uh, for that. And then also uh, on, there was a session on a learning organization, uh, how to come overcome hierarchical roles. There is, um, there's a kind of a physician dependence um, uh, in team leadership. And if the physician isn't very active, then uh, the lead, the teams, the primary health teams tend not to be uh, high performers. And why not put a nurse in charge who, is, who 
so these are the these are issues that um, we will we will be taking up, and we adjust we adjusted a lot of adjustments on the, on the different sessions. Um, we also have produced some guides um, on on coaching, uh, helping with supervision, also the, helping the managerial team that are going to be used as permanent references for them uh, after the after the program. So. Um, it, it, once the program ends and 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 the on-site coaching by the by the facilitators um, uh, may decrease or or even end, but we hope not. Uh, at least these they 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 keep these. Finally, um, just as a way of you know stepping back a little bit and what we think are some of the key messages here, um, and we and we thought there was four of them. Um, first of all. The, co the combination of on-the-job coaching and soft sales is key. It fosters continuous learning and sustainable application of technical knowledge to improve quality. The improving group dynamics, getting the teams to work together to solve their own problems, um, to question, uh, constantly question ways of doing things and to identify and test different ways of doing things better is another important component of all this. Um, another component clearly is the team-based learning with, from data. Uh, it's not just something that someone, a statistic, a, the, stati, stati, the statistical person in charge of the organization, that's not just his job. It, it's getting data to be used by in the front line and people to understand that um, um, and to see the advantage of data. And finally, this is the whole issue of organizational change who do you work with? It's not just the frontline providers, but the managers and supervisors. And this is important to create a, an organizational culture for quality improvement and continuous learning. With that, I thank you. I, back to you, Eduardo. Thank you, Jerry, for this very interesting presentation. Uh, I want to leave a question on the, on the table when we open up for the general QA, which is, which models would be amenable to uh, virtual learning, the uh, platform in case that face-to-face uh, -face engagement cannot take place? I'm assuming some are and some are not, but let's move over to our first uh, commentator. I want to introduce uh, Nana Rum Danso. Nana is a medical doctor, is a public health expert in preventive medicine with more than 20 years of experience. She is now the Managing Director of Health at the Rockefeller Foundation, where she oversees a wide array of uh, grants on the topic of public health and data analysis. She is also the uh, Adjunct Assistant Professor at the Department of Maternal and Child Care at the University of uh, North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And before joining the Rockefeller Foundation in 2019, uh, Nana founded a uh, social enterprise called MASA. She was the chief executive officer and there she promoted uh, better conditions for pregnant women and sick infants through transportation. So she has extensive field experience also in a challenging setting in Ghana. So over to you, Nana. I think uh, you're in a very experienced position to comment on the two presentations. Uh, feel free to tell you, tell us what uh, your views are, and then we'll pass over to Emma before opening up. I urge uh, the attendees to uh, use the panel for the Q&A in case you have any specific questions or general comments to the audience. Thank you, Nana. All right. All right. Thank you, Eduardo. Um, and thank you for inviting me to be a commentator on the session. Um, I listened very carefully to both presentations and I think what struck me the most as very promising and very exciting was the experiential learning component of the training. Um, Jerry mentioned the passive learning, the active learning and the experiential learning. And um, I feel based on my experience that the experiential learning is a critical component of the training because we Many of us who work in the um, quality improvement space know the limitations of workshops, whether it's a two-day workshop or a four-day workshop, you can give people as much active and passive learning as 
you can fit into that time. But the reality is what happens when they go back to their home facilities, when they go back to their units that they work in. So I think having an opportunity for the coaches and the facilitators to meet with the quote unquote trainees inside to in their workplaces for prolonged periods to see how they do their work, see what their challenges are and assist them in real time has real promise to make a difference. And let me, let me say a few things about why that's so important. One is that we know context really, really matters in terms of adopting or adapting new ideas or new techniques from one area to the other. So in, in a workshop setting, the idea might seem really compelling. You might even have a plan to do with the PDSA when you go back. But the context in which you work might be so different from the person who presented it or might be different from the next district that had success with that idea. So if you try to adopt or adapt the idea in your context and you struggle with it, it is important for the people who are facilitating to see why you're struggling. What are the factors that are influencing that um, gap between idea and translation of the idea? It could be um, team dynamics. It could be availability of equipment or supplies. It could be challenges around management enabling the work to get done. It might even be something as simple as environmental, um, the environmental layout of your facility. So if you, the coach or the facility is present, facil facilitator is present, and you can see for yourself and observe quietly to see what's working well, what's not working well, you can assist that person in translating the ideas they learn from the workshop into reality and help them problem solve as they come against barriers. That's, that's what be the main thing that I learned. I'm glad that uh, there was a validation in 2019 before COVID um, hit and you have some early data from the validation to help you define uh, how to do it in a, a larger pilot. I think the other thing that I will mention and it relates to, I think the comment, um, the last slide that Pedro presented before the end is um, sustainability. Um, how much of the facilitator coach time is, can be extended beyond the initial 12 months? What if the people get very dependent on that coaching? Um, is there a way to ensure that there's transition so that when the 12 month program ends, uh, the, the, the dependency is not so substantial? Or is there a way to structure structure the, the design of the program so that the coaching is actually part of the work. You know, so at the end of the day, if you're looking for system transformation, as you design your program, you wonder how much can stay beyond the initial program. And if you want, if that's such a critical component that you want it to stay, then we have to find a way to design upfront who can continue doing the coaching after the 12 month ends. Is it perhaps we start with two, three coaches and then we, wean it down to one to make it more cost, um, cost effective? Or is it that we, we train another layer of staff alongside the coaches so that as the coaches finish their work at the end of 12 months, um, somebody else is in that position who has the knowledge and the, the skills to do the coaching. Because sustainability cannot come at the end of, towards the end of a program. Sustainability has been designed in the program right up front just as scale is designed right up front. So those are my two major uh, comments. Over to you, Eduardo. Thank you, Nana, excellent comments. In fact, I also had the question about sustainability and how that is embedded into the design of the project. And I'm sure there's good experiences that uh, Jerry, Pedro and Emma can tell us in the QA session. We go to our last commentator, um, Emma Margarita Iriarte. Emma is a Honduran national. She is now the executive secretary of the Salud Mesoamerica Initiative, which is managed by the IADB. She is also responsible for the Regional Malaria Elimination Initiative, also at the IDB. And over the years, she has managed, supervised many health programs and has gathered extensive experience on sectoral approaches, strategic alliances, design and implementing. And I'm sure that working with this uh, very challenging setting in Latin America has been quite an experience. So, so Emma, over to you, and then we'll open up for the QA. It's a pleasure having you. Thank you, Eduardo, and thank you everybody for participating in this and having us. 
um, during this pre presentation. As part of the Salud Mesoamerica team, um, and after listening re and reflecting again about Salud Mesoamerica and what Pedro has shared and also um, uh, Jerry, um, I'd like to, to share with you that um, this has been quite a ride in terms during the last eight years, working with eight uh, governments in terms of um, thinking and supporting them on improving the quality of one of the outcomes of the health, of the, of the health system performance. And, uh, and we also acknowledge how difficult has been to intentionally and systematically support countries to implement quality improvement strategies. I think one of the main challenges and, and some of the main challenges, important ones have been, the first one is how to support teams uh, to find the right balance between measurement and action. And both Pedro and Jerry um, uh, uh, have mentioned uh, uh, what components uh, uh, we have included in, in, in this demonstrative experience so that measurement is an important aspect, but more important is the issue of what to do with that information and how to solve the problems of the health facility teams, but not only at the facility level, but also from the system perspective, understanding what is the role of other levels of the systems in terms of lifting barriers and also coaching and mentoring uh, the frontline providers. This is the first one, and, and still we are struggling with that. I hope that during the question and, and answers session, we can hear also experiences from other participants in this session. The second issue is that uh, in, in, in the design of this experience and, and in, the, in the approach we have had in terms of supporting countries on quality improvement strategies, um, we have a struggle in, in terms of how to keep, uh, to, to facilitate or to support the teams to keep the focus on the health aims and not only in the compliance, uh, on the compliance of norms. Uh, we all know that uh, there have been a focus on that and it's difficult and it's not easy to transitioning from that facility team frontline providers focus in, in compliance in norms, transitioning to uh, the system focus in terms of understanding how the systems are related to each other and how each level of the system have different roles to lift barriers and to uh, support the solution of problems from the local, from the subnational, or from the central uh, level. Um, so with this demonstrative experience, we are trying to cover some of the areas of what Pedro presented under um, a, a, the profound knowledge analysis and our theory of change. In general, it is our experience that teams, uh, frontline provi front providers, um, in general, they know what to do. But that is not enough, knowing what to do. Um, with experiences like this, what I find important is that we need intentionally address the organizational culture, the way we learn, the way and what we need to change, also the way of supporting the individual or the, the organization's uh, um, practices, changes in practices of requesting the problem, of producing local solutions, or making ourselves accountable, and also um, that profound knowledge of, of learning from others and, and having the space also to, to make mistakes and to fail without fear. So I, I think that uh, this experience um, under the, the umbrella of Salud Mesoamerica, having a results-based financing model, which is a factor we need to study, how this results-based financing model, how the external measurement that Pedro presented uh, is influencing the outcomes in quality and coverage, but also how uh, incorporating a soft skill uh, program uh, for uh, to have uh, supervisors, coaches, and other levels of the system supporting 
uh, and improving the quality of care at the primary health level uh, will be very, very critical and important. Um, I think uh, um, we, we are very um, eager and optimistic about uh, the results of this, especially not only because of uh, it's important for Honduras, but for the whole region. The learnings from this experience, um, we hopefully um, expect to be applied, implemented or adopted and adapted uh, to other countries. So I, um, uh, I, I, I look forward to discussing the sustainability issue during the, the question and, and, and answer session as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emma, and thanks for clarifying where the quality improvement piece fits into the building blocks of the whole Salud Mesoamerica objectives and the theory of change. I think Pedro's slide on the theory of change of these skills and the overall objectives of the initiative are very insightful. So uh, we have a bit under 20 minutes for a general discussion. I think several issues, very interesting issues were raised. There was a uh, a few exchanges around the sustainability. Uh, I think that's an interesting uh, discussion also based on the fact that this has been experimented in India, other places, it already went through a pilot and uh, it would be interesting to understand how it can be contextualized and sustained in the Central America and Chiapas settings. I think uh, not much has been said about COVID and what COVID represents for the whole design and eventually roll out in, uh, this year for this uh, project. And um, uh, the, the whole idea about uh, moving towards uh, a health focus rather than a compliance focus, I think that's not specific to, uh, to IADB or other projects. It, has, it is a real challenge in many other projects. So I'll pass over to uh, Pedro and, um, and Jerry to uh, maybe react to these discussions from Nana and from Emma while we get some feedback from the general audience and then put the set of other additional issues on the table. Who wants to go first? Uh, Jerry, I'll go first, Pedro? I'll go first uh, unless um, uh, Pedro has something burning that he wants to say first. Go ahead, Terry. Okay. Um, I want to, to address the sustainability issue also, because this is something that I know that I've spoken with uh, when, when Pedro and I were visiting some of the, uh, some of the sites. Um, um, and in principle, we were thinking about, um, you know, what is, what are, as Nana said, are there some staff that could possibly become the, the uh, who can continue to be the coaches, can be trained, they can continue to be the coaches. And I know that we've had these discussions about uh, the regional offices in Honduras, for example. And many countries have these regional offices in which they have their, they're called their regional supervisors. In theory, they could be trained to become, uh, the, uh, to continue as, uh, as the, the, the participate in the program and be those that carry this forward. Unfortunately, in practice, many of these supervisors be, um, uh, are pulled in many directions at once and respond to uh, often uh, their, the, the political mandates or flavor of the month mandates, and they and they're doing and they may be focusing on on some aspect and this month and the next aspect some other month, and it may not be the best. Um, it may not work out. However. As I'll go back to say, in theory, um, they could be trained. They certainly have the capacity to do this, um, and they could be trained to to be the coaches. But in, in pra I'm unsure they'll be able to carry out in practice, uh, or will have to, or maybe what is meant by train by by supervision has to has that whole model has to change. And I know that we've had discussions on that also. Um, maybe Pedro, you you and I have talked about this. Maybe you can weigh in on what you think. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Jerry. So I'm just gonna give a few thoughts on this sustainability issue. Uh, I think it's it's really important and it's really complex. And I think something that we we always struggle on how to how to approach it. So so just a, a few thoughts on how how. Uh, 
how we're thinking about it and what we're doing. And of course, there's the, this, this, this thinking uh, might change as, as, as soon as we start going. But I think one of the key, I think one of the key changes that we're doing with testing this program on middle managers is most of the work is essentially that most of the work that we have previously done on SMI on QI, uh, all that coaching part was essentially done by people from SMI. So, so the SMI has a coordination unit, it's a QI team, and this team is a really good team and they are the ones that coaching the, the teams and helping all the, the countries with the QI strategies. Um, but part of the, the issue that we're trying to, to address here is to forming these, at least some of these middle managers in, in this training that we're doing to have some of the abilities for them to be coaches in some way, at least within their network or their RIAM or, or responsibility, either being a supervisor or a manager of primary networks. And these are participants of the program. The idea is that if they have this longer exposure, not just on learning how to do things, but the idea is how to coach others on doing this, uh, especially with this experiential learning, they might be able to, to, to do this in their own work uh, on a daily basis. So you might have a, a set of uh, middle managers from, from, the, from the primary care networks, from the regional level and the central level, you have a cadre of workers that have these abilities. Of course, some of them will be really good at it. Some of them might not <laughs> get most of it, but the idea is that to form these, these middle managers to, to do that. So, that. so that's one thing that I, I, I think it's important to, to clarify on the approach. And I think the other two things is, uh, and, and it's also related to sustainability, is that in, in Honduras, I guess like in parallel of that we're doing this, we didn't go that too much into detail what we're doing right now, um, but we're helping the, the health ministry to, to reorganize like in their structure, how they approach quality improvement uh, on their own, essentially to make the, uh, their structure more conducive to sustain these efforts like in, in the later part. Of course, that's, that's, that's a, a, something that we started about a year and a half ago. It's also like a long way, but we have um, the QI team has, the, the SMI QI team has been working with them to try to, to, to redesign their structure so it's more conducive to sustain these QI efforts. And yeah, I guess those those two items are are, are really important. And, and the other thing that I wanted to, to touch on, and I think that I really like uh, Nana's suggestion on, on how to approach sustainability is essentially what happens afterwards. No, essentially we have twelve months that they will be coached, but but how how are we going to incorporate this uh, cadre of, of workers that have been trained into these uh, efforts, like in in the future or someone else? And and that's also something that we have. Uh, been planning, but still haven't figured out like the, the exact pieces on how, how how they will fit, how to how to essentially provide some support even as the program ends, so they can continue doing the work that that, that they're doing. And I'm gonna switch over to Emma. Which I'm sure she has some more thoughts on on sustainability as well. Thank you, Pedro. Um, in the in the under the umbrella of Salud Mesoamerica. Uh, we also provide assistance to the central level and regional levels, including technical assistance for, for um, quality improvement, not only to the frontline providers, providers, but also to the um, directorates of first level and second level of attention, for example, and the national uh, quality unit yeah, in, in, in Honduras and in other countries. Uh, in one of the discussion, in addition to what Pedro um, has described, is how to, to revisit and to modify the supervision guideline and policy that the Ministry of Health has and that the regions in this geographic, uh, the subnational levels, I mean, when I say regions, the subnational levels have to implement and, and to follow uh, with the uh, frontline providers. And one of the discussions have been how to incorporate in those guidelines, supervision -like guidelines, the learnings from this demonstrative experience so that uh, uh, the issues about these soft skills, uh, coaching, mentoring approach can be also included 
not not only for quality because quality shouldn't be a program yeah but not but in the in the general supervision um, guideline and in, in, in policy so these are not easy processes and, and it, it take time probably and we are aware of that that will go beyond the time of Salud Mesoamerica we end next year uh, but because of the position of the bank in which we have a, a, a bigger portfolio with the Ministry of Health. Uh, we have, with the Ministry of Health, uh, identify support that can go after Salud Mesoamerica finishes um, uh, using or leveraging uh, funding from other uh, operations that are already at the country level with other uh, IDB funding. So. I think this is an important issue because it goes beyond one demonstrative experience and, and, and it's how to support countries to the main learnings to be incorporated in routine instruments they already have. That will take in our estimation probably a, a process of two years that has already started. But as I said, and, and as you can imagine, incorporating an innovation in a system is, is not easy. It must be intentionally well planned and it needs time for all the processes and, and competencies to be built across the system. Uh, but that's just another, another issue that we have negotiated with the Ministry of Health and the authorities in Honduras. Um, the other issue for sustainability is that under Salud Mesoamerica, uh, we are also working on quality improvement uh, uh, at the secondary and tertiary level of attention, not only the level that uh, of primary health care uh, that, um, uh, that was presented today, which is the, the very frontline um, providers uh, at the primary and sort of secondary level, but we also support this system approach where, as you know, it's really important that uh, collaborative efforts and referral and contra-referral and all those issues that are linked to the performance of, of these uh, uh, networks. And the third, the third element is that uh, since one year ago, we started planning for sustainability with uh, the countries participating in Salud Mesoamerica. And using the um, EcoCycle uh, tool, uh, we have started analyzing what interventions, in what stage each intervention is, which one is uh, in growth, in mature state, and which, which interventions need to be um, a, a, be um, in English, I'm sorry, constructive destruction, destruction, yeah? So which interventions and tools need to be simplified or some of the issues eliminated for those to be sustainable? Uh, by June, we expect in Honduras specifically, because this work have been done in, uh, has already been done in El Salvador, and it started in Belize, but in Honduras by June, we, we hope to have uh, the decision on, on uh, some milestones from now to June next year uh, in terms of sustainability and scaling up. Of course, it's not easy. We don't have all the answers. Um, it has been difficult for us to find like a solid framework on not on discussing sustainability, but on how to plan it and how to support a country to do to actually do it. So if if you have any ideas or suggestions from the presenters and the panelists or from the um, audience, we we would like to hear about them. Thank you. Thank thank you, Emma. The the region has been privileged by being at the forefront of a regional collaboration, countries tend to co to collaborate and the sustainability of having the, country, the countries share their experiences and maybe train trainers across borders, I think is a major point, especially also it includes the South of Mexico. Nana, would you like to add anything uh, to the discussion? Um, sure, um, I can make a comment and then a follow up to one of the questions you asked Eduardo, which we still haven't addressed. And that question is what do we do with workshops in the setting of COVID if we can't have in-person workshops? What, what are the 
contingencies around uh, virtual? I think that's a, a really tough question uh, given the slow rollout of the vaccines around the world in 2020. We may not get to the in-person workshop environment until 2022 or maybe even later in some parts of the world. So I think that's an important question and we probably should try and address it before the end. But I, I just wanted to touch on uh, a really critical part of sustainability and scale. We've talked about the people and the design. I think the other piece is what Jerry referred to as soft skills. And I would like to emphasize that more talking about the culture of the organization within which this improvement is happening. And culture is one of those things that you can't see, but you can feel, you can experience. And really um, for improvement to be successful, we know that culture starts with leadership intention leadership and management intention towards improvement. Are people actually walking the talk or do they say a lot of nice things about, we aim to achieve this, we're gonna reduce this mortality or morbidity, or we're going to increase this or that. But then in reality, when you go to them with a request for resources or request for even just time to do the improvement work, you don't get the, the, the follow through. So we need to start thinking about Improvement succeeds and is sustained the most when we have a receptive culture. Leadership at the top, senior leaders, managers in the middle, do they relieve bottlenecks? Do they enable the work to go on? Or are they, um, are they indifferent? Do they present obstacles for changes that you would like to implement perhaps at the unit level, at the hospital or clinic level? So as we think about sustainability, let's think about the environment, the culture, and what does it take over time for organizational cultures to change? It's not a one year, it could be five, it could be 10, and a lot of it depends on the leaders and the managers. Let me stop there so we have enough time to, to discuss other issues. Very, cha very challenging the cultural settings and contextualization. Uh, any other comments, especially on the last issue on adapting to COVID settings? I just um, would want to um, echo what uh, Nana said, um, that working at the organizational level is key. And I recall the meetings we had with the organizational directors or coordinators um, and, and the supervisory team, which also serve as managers. So this, we all kind of call them middle managers. And getting them to be enablers uh, and creating this as, as, as in creating this environment to be supportive of change, um, you well you see huge variation. Um, you see anywhere from people who don't get it to people who absolutely accept it and uh, and want to push forward. And I think that um, this harking back a little bit to I think well, either Pedro or, or Emma is there some way that we can combine these people or get one group to help another group, maybe for some cross organizational learning collaborative that could work in which you have, um, you have the, the managers from different uh, organizations working with other organizations or uh, creating a shared learning environment uh, to help them solve, uh, to uh, help them with their, um, uh, with the types of changes that need to be made at the organizational level for quality. Thanks. Back to you. Thank you, Jerry. We're reaching our end of the session on the two minutes. Any final remarks from anybody? Emma, please. Yeah, I'd just like to say that while I was listening to Nana and we have had the fortune to have her guidance on, on some of the years of Salud Mesoamerica, um, you know, I just remember in a discussion with a um, um, uh, health directorate from one of the countries. And we talk about this learning environment and leadership support and et cetera. But when we were discussing the data management tools, uh, she wanted to know exactly which one of the units were failing in which aspects. I mean, which lab exams and lab tests, for example. So the, how, how difficult it is to close the gap between what we say and what we really are doing. Yeah, how the practice and, and our aspirations are really far apart. And, and, and we hope that this demonstrative experience can, 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 can tell us, can inform or provide some inputs 
on what are the factors that could close the gap between what we think that we are doing and what we are really doing and how the importance of leadership and this middle manager um, layer uh, to be aware and intentionally implementing and acting and using the soft skills and the mentoring and the guidance that um, the teams in, in the primary uh, level actually need to produce results, not only to report, not only to, um, to provide information that we think others want, want to listen to. So I think this is a huge challenge and, and we are look, looking forward to it and oh, hopefully to discuss with you the results soon. Thank you, Emma. Now, unfortunately, we reached the end. Uh, I just wanna thank you, Nana, Pedro, Jerry, Emma, wonderful, very, very uh, informative session. Uh, we all wish you the best. Many countries and funders will be watching closely how this takes place in such a very important moment and a needed health uh, uh, boost. So uh, all the best. I, I ask the participants to stay for a few minutes just to look at some uh, administrative uh, messages. And please stay safe and take care. Okay, uh, Pedro, do you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I think we're offline, right, with the rest? I mean, Eduardo, do you hear me? I think, I'm not sure. Um, uh, maybe the... Uh... Well, it doesn't matter. It was a wonderful yeah. session. Thank you to everybody. Okay, uh, thank you. And uh, Nana said something about a link uh, to the session. I think that's gonna be done by the uh, technical organizers. Um, and I think there's a recording is going to be made available. Mm -hmm. And I think we're going to be, uh, Ed, Eduardo, I think we have to send in our, if you send me the last version of the PowerPoint, I will forward it to the session or to the, to the conference organizers. Wonderful.